I'm excited to introduce our first speaker um, of the day. Leila Serengi is the Director of Social Action at Family Service Toronto and the National Director of Campaign 2000, which is a pan-Canadian movement working to end child and family poverty. With over 20 years of frontline research and policy experience, Leila understands that the people experiencing systemic marginalization can often be the furthest from decision-making. Her professional experience demonstrates commitment to connecting lived reality with public policy, advocating with and engaging people in meaningful ways to inform policy and legislative changes. Um, Layla, we're so excited to have you and I will pass the microphone to you. Thanks so much, Mallory, for that uh, land acknowledgement and the kind introduction. I'm so excited uh, to be here today to share um, just a few points in the 15 minutes that I've got about what I've learned over the years, um, tips that I wanted to share with folks here around um, how to best, uh, what I've learned to be best practices in terms of advocating within the non, within a nonprofit um, context. So the next slide um, is, I just thought I'd start by sharing Family Service Toronto's approach to uh, system level work. This is our theory of change. This is how we are organized. Um, so you'll see in the center of this diagram that we acknowledge that poverty, marginalization, discrimination um, are the root causes of inequities um, and root causes of the inequities that people who come to us for service experience. And those issues that we do intervention and prevention services with are for people with developmental disabilities, people with mental health concerns and uh, women and gender diverse people who have experienced violence and abuse. Um, so that's those kind of inner circles, um, including our frontline service work. Um, the, the middle circle where the color starts to get lighter is our knowledge and knowledge building, knowledge exchange work, which is really our research and evaluation work. You know, we look at our programs and services, we talk to service users um, to better understand whether our programs are responsive, are they low barrier, are they meeting needs, are they flexible, are they changing, you know, with the issues that are coming to us, what are we learning, and then sharing that back out both at the front lines, but also across the sector. Um, and then the system level work, which is our social, what we call social action, which is, you know, really about communities coming together to facilitate change on issues that they've identified. And my role is to facilitate that work, but it's driven by all of those inner circles. So really informed by um, people who are coming to us for service and the research and the evaluation. Um, and of course, the, the staff who are working in the organization. As part of my role, as Mallory said, I um, serve as the national director for Campaign 2000, which is a coalition that came about um, in response to a 1989 federal all part like unanimous resolution that was passed in the House of Commons to end child poverty by the year 2000. And at that time, nonprofits like Family Service Toronto, who were working in that area, um, saw that after that resolution had passed, there actually wasn't any positive change. And in fact, poverty was starting to get worse in our communities. And so about 30 or 35 organizations convened in Ottawa in 1991 and wrote the first annual report card. And, and it was in those early days that Family Service Toronto um, offered to provide, to be the host um, for the campaign. And we've been doing that work ever since. And, you know, we have grown in, in numbers and activities, but that's kind of, that's how we have um, approached this work. And of course the vision is so that, you know, individuals and families have greater stability and resi resilience, but in those just and supportive communities. Um, and so the next slide um, is that, you know, I just, that nonprofits, you know, we do have this um, really valuable impact on public policy. I've included this quote by Desmond Tutu because I think it really uh, captures what, um, you know, what, what we're here to talk about today. And so he says, he has said that there comes a point when we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. And that's about uncovering those root causes. So yeah, we can keep continuing to provide those frontline services and dealing with the immediate crisis, but 
you know, what's the environment that's keeping people in that crisis and what can we learn from those patterns that we're seeing and those barriers people are facing to affect that systemic change. Um, so I was reading in this nonprofit quarterly article that was asking, um, you know, what prevents nonprofits from engaging in public policy work? Who are we afraid of? And generally it's about, you know, we don't want to upset our funders, our donors, our board members, um, but that kind of um, thinking, which can be very internalized in our organizations, really uh, connects to those very power dynamics that inhibit um, good public policy as a strategy to advance equity and justice. And also um, philanthropy is having its own kind of reckoning right now. So Family Service Toronto is a United Way agency. We had to demonstrate that we are working towards systemic change, that we are doing this kind of um, convening and advocacy work to be successful in our anchor agency application. So, you know, there is that kind of um, support. Um, I know that, you know, sometimes, especially up until 2018, charities were really afraid to lose their status. Um, and that was a real fear. But since 2018, the um, rules have changed and there is no limit to the amount of you know, advocacy um, we can do. It's called in the legislation, um, public policy dialogue and development activities and organizations can choose to spend 100% of their time um, doing that work. Uh, it's good to know what those rules are. It has to be, you know, nonpartisan. So sticking to the issues, not supporting individual, you know, parties or people running for, um, you know, candidates who are running for political office, but make, making sure you're working across parties, staying nonpartisan in your activities. Those rules may change. We, I know we have elections coming up, so the rules may change a bit during um, elections. So it's good to know those. Um, and you may have to, depending on the amount of work that you're doing, you may have to register as a lobbyist. So for example, I'm registered as a federal lobbyist because of my work of campaign 2000 takes me into parliament uh, quite often and I am trying to get buy-in for specific policies and programs and so I do have to re register and report monthly on those activities. But I think once you know the rules, there is, you know, you, you then know how to kind of play within those rules. Um, the next, so that's my, my first takeaway. Um, the next one is to develop strategic partnerships. And I know oftentimes this gets presented or at least like the kinds of, you know, tips and top five ed pieces of advice. Oftentimes strategic partnership is really about partnering with other nonprofits, but I've intentionally included community here as a strategic partner because I think um, we do need to be valuing people who are living in our communities, who are experiencing these kinds of barriers as, you know, equal partners in this work, right? I don't think that, you know, I, I think it becomes problematic when um, we're not mindful of the kind of power dynamics within our relationships, when we're taking those stories and voices and using it to promote, you know, our own agendas. Um, and so being mindful about that and being, um, you know, really, uh, valuing that engagement as um, as much as we value, you know, our own input and the input of that researchers and other kinds of evidence in terms of this, the work as it develops. So, so I think, you know, thinking about community uh, and community members as strategic partners can take us a really long way in this work. Um, that nonprofit quarterly article also talked about, um, uh, you know, that the limited amount of resources we have in this sector and the competition that can happen between our organizations um, leads to inauthentic and ineffective collaboration. And so it's important to break out of that scarcity mind mindset. And people, uh, places like the Ontario Nonprofit Network and Imagine Canada are doing some really um, great work to show the value of our work, the number of people that we employ, the amount um, that our labor contributes to the GDP, right? Like there is a lot of power in this sector. Um, and the reality is, is that the human services, the services that we provide um, are things that the government relies on. They're services that the government should be doing. Um, and by 
acknowledging, understanding that, reclaiming that power, coming together in networks, um, you know, it helps to, it builds a lot of power. And I think it's important to think about that and just, you know, be confident in reclaiming um, that power. And so we can do that in networks and coalitions. So like Campaign 2000 is a very long term, uh, hopefully not another 30 years, but, you know, it is a longer term project, um, but then you can also come together on a short term initiative. And, you know, when Doug Ford was first elected, one of the first things he did was announce the cut to the transitional child benefit. That's a child benefit that was for um, people with precarious immigration status. And so a number of organizations came together, organized over several months. Uh, we ended up winning. And once we had that win, that group kind of disbanded. So you can come together over these shorter term um, agendas or longer term uh, projects um, where we can share leadership and bring, you know, diverse voices to the table and diverse skill sets. Um, and don't be afraid to play a secretariat role. That's how Family Service started with Campaign 2000. You know, the note take, like, we do note taking for the minutes. We, you know, organize meetings. We draft letters um, and then share information and things like that. And that can be a really important role and really important to keeping um, the work moving along. Um, the next one is, you know, developing your ask, you know, your the, the solution that you want to see um, using trauma-informed, feminist, intersectional um, analysis. And there's Lot, there's resources out there that can, you know, kind of guide you in how to do this. If you have questions around how to get started, uh, Campaign 2000 is also working on a tool through one of our projects that will be uh, released later in this year, uh, later this year. Um, but you want to be able to articulate what's the issue that you've identified, how the, what are the inequities that exist in relation to the issue uh, you want to know the pol current policy responses, our program responses, what's working, what's not working. Think about proposing your solutions over, you know, it could be short, medium, and long-term kinds of frameworks, but using that evidence base. And so thinking about the audience, if they're public um, policy officials, government officials, if they like that evidence, those numbers, that hard uh, quantitative data, but there is also so much value in the qualitative, that storytelling, the patterns that you are hearing about in your case management work. Um, you know, media also really likes to have that mix of both the personal and then also those numbers. So where you can draw on research reports or partner with um, academics or even think tanks, you know, progressive think tanks um, that help to bring in resources to develop some of this stuff that all helps to go a long way. Um, and then the next, so that's, you know, a little bit about, you know, developing the ask, being organized in that way, being prepared for um, the next slide, which is knowing how government works uh, and when to engage with government. So I'm just going to use in the next couple of slides, City of Toronto examples, but it's not too different from if you're advocating for something at the provincial level or the federal level. And it is important to know um, the jurisdiction of the policy area you're, you're talking about. Um, so in this slide, it, this just shows the City of Toronto's decision-making process from where the idea comes up at the beginning um, and then a report will be generated from that idea or the issue or the problem that's been identified. It'll go to um, a standing committee or a community council for debate. It might get sent back to staff for more research or to answer some questions. It'll come back to the standing committee and then it will get moved um, along with its recommendations to council. Council will debate they may send it back to staff um, for further questions or further research, uh, and then it'll come back and final voting, final decisions will be made. And then they'll implement and monitor and evaluate and report back. And along the bottom, you see that there's points in time for the public, that's us as well, to engage in that process. So from the issue identification to deputing at um, you know, committees, and in between, you can 
you know, meet with elected officials on the issues. Um, so that's kind of the decision making process. And it's important to yeah, have a bit of an understanding about this and know when you can bring where there's opportunities to bring your, your issue forward. On the next slide, so this is just the structure of the city of Toronto. You've got those um, the 25 councillors, the mayor, those uh, special committees and the standing committees where you can go and make the presentation on the issue. Um, and it's important, you know, to develop those relationships with the elected officials, whether it's a city councillor or an MP or an MPP, um, to kind of um, share your either get support for your issue or try to get them to support your issue. They may not be into, they may not know about the issue or they may be kind of like a neutral and move towards being your support. But it's important to, yeah, bring those to your elected officials. If you are, um, you know, sending an email or making a call and you're hearing back from the political staff, maybe it's their assistant or somebody working in their office, that's also a good thing. Those folks also have um, a lot of power and can raise an issue um, with the elected officials. So developing, developing those kinds of relationships is important. Um, the next slide is the City of Toronto's organizational structure. And I only show this to show how big the organization is. Um, so there's a lot of people who are not political staff or political representatives who are policy people who are working in different divisions who are also good to know, like it's also good to know who has um, the mandate over the issue that you're talking about. So if it's like, um, you know, children's services, if, you know, you're advocating for better childcare subsidies or uh, flexible childcare hours, you know, developing relationships with people who are working within um, children's services, who are doing that research, who are writing the policies, um, the managers there, that those are all good relationships to have. There's a lot of power in the work that those people do. And they're the ones who are gonna generate those reports that go to city council and make, and they're putting the pen to paper for the recommendations. So, you know, this is a little bit, but you know, some people will call the inside game, right? How do you find these, you know, finding these actors, knowing who's gonna help you on the inside, move your issue forward and building, the, building out those relationships. Um, and then this is a little bit your outside game. Um, and so how do you build that community power? What are some of the tactics that you're gonna use? This will depend on uh, on a variety of different things, but a lot on you know your resources, the kinds of resources and time that you have on what's gonna work. And this is just a, um, a snapshot. There's, there's other things you can do, but you know, you can organize town halls or forums to engage the public or get in, get input from the public. Um, a social media, you could do a, you know, a campaign over Twitter or Instagram and get your message out and use hashtags and tag, uh, elected officials, tag the media. Um, a lot of people are using and organizing over, you know, social media it can be really, um, uh, powerful and very cheap to do. Uh, you can do a letter writing campaign, you can write individual letters, you can have an open letter that partners sign on to, and then you've got, you know, dozens or hundreds of people signing on to one letter, or you can create form letters, those kind of templates that you pass around and people can sign their own individual, and then you've got uh, many, many letters getting sent to the elected official. You can do, um, phone zaps, which have been happening a lot during pandemic, which has been really neat to see and participate in and email zaps. Uh, you can create um, a petition and those can be done over like the free Google forms or, you know, change.org, or you can even do the, like the House of Commons if you have a federal issue and you want something to get brought to the floor of the house, you can have a, you can work with an MP to sponsor a, um, a House of Commons petition. And then you can do, you know, coordinate meetings with elected officials or organize a full on uh, lobby day or lobby week where you're meeting, different people are meeting across a jurisdiction with different um, elected officials. So you choose the constellation of which or the one or two or, you know, uh, what's going to work for you. Um, and then lastly, my last 
takeaway is to don't forget to um, evaluate your efforts, get feedback, retool your strategies where you need to, and always, always, always celebrate your wins and um, acknowledge people for the work that they're putting into this. Um, yeah, so that's what I have to share in terms of some quick takeaways. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for uh, listening. And if you want to stay in touch or join the Campaign 2000 Coalition, this is how you can reach out to us. Um, and we do have um, a membership expectation form on the website, which is just, um, well, it's very uh, a help low barrier, easy to become um, an active coalition member. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. And I look forward to taking um, any questions. Amazing. Thank you so much, Layla. I love how you were able to somehow synthesize <laughs> like a master's in how to <laughs> introduce advocacy into a very quick 15 minute presentation. Um, a lot of great gems there in terms of, you know, a, a broad understanding of, of good approaches to it. So um, I would love to then introduce Katie as our second speaker and saying a big thanks to Layla. Um, Katie oversees food shares programs happening in community and, commun and school spaces and also ensures that programs are advancing food shares advocacy goals around reconciliation, racial justice, environmental justice, and realizing the right to food. Her community organizing work is in food justice, affordable housing, wealth redistribution, and police abolition. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Katie. Thanks, Mallory. Um, Leila, that was great. Um, and nice to have kind of like an overview of what's, you know, things to consider and, and what's possible. And um, in planning the session, we thought that uh, it might be helpful to share some tangible steps that one organization has taken as we try and move. You know, FoodShare was not founded as an advocacy organization in the ways that some other organizations are. And what does it mean to be an organization that's moving more boldly into the advocacy space? So that's what I'll focus on today. Um, so at FoodShare, um, our vision is that we want to see a Toronto where all people can feed themselves and their loved ones and their communities with dignity and joy. Um, and that's what all of our programs are sort of working towards realizing. Um, so here's a, just a nice photo. Um, one of the, the key things we're known for is um, something called the Good Food Box, which is a box of produce that anyone in the city of Toronto can order. Um, it's for sale as a social enterprise, and we use the funds from those boxes to support our food justice programming. Um, and you can go to the next slide uh, to give you a sense of like, if you're not familiar with food share, um, we have kind of four big program areas. So that good food box sits in the social enterprise piece. So that's where we're trying to generate revenue intentionally that's unrestricted that we can then allocate towards our food justice work, including our advocacy work, because advocacy work is often hard to fund. Um, and then in terms of programs, we have um, community action support, which is a team of food share staff whose role is to support, support other grassroots groups in running their own projects, their own interventions, building their own work along their own self-determined goals. Um, so that looks like an a, a community group running their own produce market, a community group setting up their own farm, um, a community group running their own food distribution project. Then we also have a community food growing team where we're actually running food growing projects ourselves. Um, that looks like therapeutic gardens at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, um, a large multi-acre urban farm at a high school in Etobicoke, um, and supporting projects like Black Creek Community Farm, which is an eight acre farm um, in Jane Finch in, in the city here in Toronto. And then um, the other sort of bucket of what we do is the community learning and engagement, which looks a lot like um, education work happening in schools, with different community populations, adults, seniors, kids, caregivers um, around food justice education issues. So it's an example of an organization that's fairly large. We've been around for about 35 years, coming from a place of having like a big mix of program um, offering service offerings, but not necessarily an advocacy focus in terms of like when we were founded or how, how our work is shaped, um, but an interest in doing more advocacy work. Um, you can go to the next slide. So to give you a sense of how large we are, there's about 350,000 people across the city that we kind of engage with, whether it's through food distribution, programming, 
Um, it's three and a half million pounds of produce that we're distributing through our warehouse every year. So it's a, that's a fairly large team um, and 34 different community groups that we support in running their own projects and programs. So one of the things that's great about FoodShare is we have a huge network of people that touch the organization and are in contact with the organization in a, a very wide variety of ways. And for advocacy work, that's a huge asset. Um, this past year during COVID, a lot of things paused, whereas a lot of things really expanded. And one of the things we did this year was offer an emergency good food box that was free to the recipient. It was the first time we've ever done free food in our history. Um, and the way that we did that was through a network of, of agency partners. And so that's also another light bulb for us is as we build this network of community organizations and mutual aid projects across the city, um, how do we engage all those people in the advocacy work that we want to see happening? So that just gives you a sense of kind of who we are and what we do. Um, <clears throat> so the approach that we take towards all of our work um, is that we want to be working towards justice um, and, and centering justice um, and everything that we do, that we're cued by uh, communities themselves, and that we're embedding advocacy into our work. And I'm going to tell you a bit more specifically about how we how we did that. Um, things that kind of ground it for us, and that Fujir has been pretty vocal about recently, is that we are very mindful and front and center about the the understanding that charity cannot fix food insecurity, um, and that programs cannot fix food insecurity. Um, and that food insecurity is an issue of income and race, and that we can only address it by policy and systems level change. Um, and so for us, that means using the Good Food Box and all of our programs as a vehicle for advancing our advocacy work and putting that front and center, something that staff talk about all the time, the board talks about all the time. And I would say it was not the way that the organization talked about charity <laughs> five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So, so organizations, um, can can make a big shift like that. So advocacy, um, some common concerns that you know that came up. I've been at Food Shift for ten years, so I feel like in many ways I work at I've worked at two different organizations, even though I've been at the same space for ten years. Um, things that came up at Food Share and that I hear all the time are, uh, well, what's the organization's voice on an issue versus I know an individual staff wants us to take a position on something, particularly a concern if you're the executive director or you know, uh, in a leadership position if people think, oh, well, that's just your perspective on an issue. Um, how do you develop alignment between the staff, the organization leadership and the board? Those, those groups can be very far apart sometimes. Um, speed and timeliness. A lot of organizations make decisions, especially if they assume that there's a level of risk associated very slowly. And a lot of the issues that we're working on when it comes to advocacy work are urgent. So how do you reconcile that? Um, and where does it live within an organization is, was key for us. Um, where do you actually house the person who's going to kind of like uh, bottom the, you know, support, be kind of a backbone support for the advocacy space. So I'll talk about what we considered in making that change. Um, so one of the examples I wanted to talk about specifically was farm labor. Um, so this is a picture of one of our high school farms. It's Burnham Thorpe Collegiate Institute. Uh, it's just nice, nice to have a nice farm photo. <laughs> um, <laughs> but here you'll see that for as long as I've worked at FoodShare, uh, staff and community members have asked FoodShare to take a public stance on migrant farm workers um, in support of migrant farm workers and against uh, worker policies that are exploitive. All the time I heard, yes, absolutely, we need to do this, but what if we alienate the, the farms that we currently purchase from? Um, and who use migrant farm workers. Uh, we don't want to be hypocrites if we're buying food from farms who use farm workers, but then calling out these policies at the same time. What if we lose donors? Uh, what if there's pushback from government and, and we're calling out government on one side, but applying for funding on the other side? Uh, yes, but half the board doesn't agree. These staff agree. These staff don't agree. And the end result of all of those <laughs> sort of questions is that we end up not doing anything about it. This is a familiar story, I'm sure, <laughs> across different, you know, different organizations in the sector across issues. Um, so you can go to the next one. Um, and so what we did is we felt we needed a, a mechanism to come to a consensus when someone at FoodShare, either a community member, a community partner, a staff at FoodShare said, I think FoodShare needs to take a position on XYZ. 
Um, how do we make that decision in a way that feels good? So the steps that we took are that we formed an advocacy committee and that membership includes staff and we were intentional that it has to include staff who are not management. Um, it can include staff that are management as well. It also includes community members who don't work for the organization and are outside of the organization in terms of that connection. And it also has some board members. Um, the executive director and myself are on it, but we don't vote. So we actually don't say, yes, this is good or this is not good. Um, we're there for like, if someone has a question and needs more information to consider something. It's co-chaired by a staff member and a board member. So they share that responsibility. And whenever a request to endorse, like, you know, a statement about government cuts or, or anything like that, the first step is that it goes to the advocacy committee for consideration um, over email and they vote by consensus. So sometimes it happens where everyone says, yep, this absolutely fits with food shares work. Let's support this. Often there's someone who might say, no, because I need more information about the background or what they're asking for, who's making the demand. Um, they might say, I, this is good, but it's not food shares work. Or they might say, no, um, because you know they're speaking about Black families and it's not being led by Black communities. So this particular action is not something that we want to support, as an example. Um, so if you go to the next slide, that means that if the committee can't come to a consensus that yes, food share should endorse this or support this or do something about this, um, it doesn't move ahead. And it doesn't mean that it's not like a worthwhile, valid issue. It just means that it's not our work or it might not be our work right now. Um, if they do come to consensus, it goes to the board and they vote by email and then it's a majority vote. That means that when, you, when you're bringing something to the board, it already has unanimous support from a mix of people who care about the organization and think regularly about the organization's role in advocacy work. So you're already bringing something. <laughs> if it feels like it's a little bit risky or a little bit controversial, it's only coming to them if there is a unanimous support behind it already, which softens <laughs> um, and kind of warms the introduction to like this being something that the organization should work on. Uh, the board then votes, and if they vote to support it, then we support it in whatever way it is, whether it's signing onto a letter or a coalition or endorsing something. Um, so that means that by the time Food Share writes a letter about anything, um, it's gone through that committee, it has support from the board, it has support from the executive director. So, you know, we put out a letter about the police budget. That I can confidently say eight, eight years ago, Food Share never would have done. <laughs> This time we did it. And when people did, a lot of people wrote to us to say that they loved what we said. There were a few people who pushed back, but staff then and board members feel solid in the stance that they're taking on the issue because they know that there's this consensus within the organization um, around the issue, which has been key. We also did some work around identifying, like there are some things that we're always gonna say yes to. So that group worked on um, identifying what some pillars were for the organization and these were considered ours. So it is useful, I think, for organizations to think about, are there one or two things, two or three things um, that consistently you know you're gonna sign on to and procedurally it makes it quicker. Um, when, you're, when you're responding to things, especially like COVID cuts or those types of things, we're not doing like a long multi-month process around considering how to act, so. Uh, you know, the next one. So for another question for us was, we didn't have like an advocacy director um, and trying to figure out where does it live? So there's so many options around where advocacy work sits within an organization. Um, I've seen it often with communications because it, it is often an outward facing activity. Um, I've seen it paired with like a government relations role, especially depending on what sector you're in and how you're funded and how much regulation you have and where the regulation is coming from. Um, advocacy and research is really common. Um, and at Food Share, we were pretty intentional about pairing it with programs. Um, and part of that was over the last couple of years, intentionally reframing our thinking about what is the point of a program? Um, what's the purpose of a program in sort of a charitable nonprofit space? So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So for us, it means even though we have a, you know, a 35 year history of running really excellent programs, 
Um, getting honest about the fact that programs alone um, will not address food insecurity. And I think that's the same for many of the other issues that we're working towards addressing um, in nonprofit spaces. Um, in terms of food, research shows that food insecure people have the same and better skills when it comes to cooking from scratch or shopping on a budget. And so designing programs that are meant to teach people who have you know, experienced food insecurity how to cook from scratch is not only not enough, it also often comes from a classist and racist understanding of what people already know how to do and are capable of. Um, so it's not to say that programs are inherently bad, but that they're inadequate if what we want is to win real change. So um, it meant that we were no longer gonna run a program just to run a program. We were gonna run a program because it's a key piece of our advocacy work. Um, so it's a reframing all of our programs as shifting our thinking around those being organizing spaces um, so that we're building our broad base of support around the issue so that we can then mobilize those people on advocacy work. Um, and so on the next slide, talk a little bit more about organizing. Organizing is connecting with people in your community, particularly who don't already agree with you <laughs> or who aren't already on your email list, <laughs> aren't already bought into the work that you're doing. They're deeply familiar with the issue, but they're not yet connected to you, or they're perhaps not yet thinking about it in the way that involves this kind of like structural thinking. Um, it involves building your broad base of supporters. It involves relationship building and sort of raising that political understanding of, it's not enough to just talk about food skills. Why is food skills specifically uh, so closely tied to income and poverty? And how is that so closely tied to things like capitalism and racism and patriarchy and colonialism? <laughs> That's the organizing. And the idea is we want to do that so that we can then move those people into the mobilizing piece. So setting up really easy ways for people to mail a postcard, email a, a person, empower a politician, make calls, use their petition tools, show up to action. So we didn't want to have these programs over here where someone comes and cooks and then they leave. And then over here, we're saying, hey, everyone sign our petition. We could say, well, we have access to all of these people. We're doing this education work here. We center it in that political, you know, small p political <laughs> um, understanding around the issue. And while you're here, here are some mobilizations that feed into the advocacy goals that the organization has identified as our work. Um, so an example of that, we used to run something, or we do run something called the Great Big Crunch. It's really straightforward. Literally, you just eat an apple at the same time. Everyone eats an apple at the same time. <laughs> um, it's grown to like, 200,000 people eat an apple at the same time. We used to create these education tools that were like, here's what you can know about apples. Um, very, very neutral in terms of <laughs> what types of issues you were talking about. Um, and since doing this work around what was Fruger's position on migrant farm workers, our education guide this year was entirely about migrant farm workers, the issues that they face. And then we paired it with a webinar where we had migrant farm workers on the section and we geared it towards a school audience um, and outreach with schools and then fed that into a conversation around what needs to change at a policy level. So instead of having these silos across the organization, thinking about programs can feed into an advocacy goal to get us closer to like how you win what we want quicker. So, um, another example is um, a right to food campaign that we're working on right now. We want the city to update the food charter to rewrite it. And we're currently going through every single, every single way that we talk to people, whether it's through a program, an e-news, they buy a good food box, a customer, <laughs> how can we get those people engaged in the, the campaign? So as an example, um, another one to think of like golf courses with this question of like knowing what you want to win. We kind of opened up this can of worms talking about golf courses in the city of Toronto, along with some other organizations, Progress Toronto and Toronto Environmental Alliance. A lot of people were saying like, oh, does FoodShare want to turn a, a, a golf course into a farm and run it? And we were like, no, <laughs> we don't want to do that. But do we want the city to have to consult with the people who actually live near the golf course and have no access to green space and also feel excluded from this use of a public land? That's what we want. So we consider this campaign successful because we were clear about what the win was that we wanted. Um, so just as an example, like, it, the wind doesn't always have to be like a law is changed <laughs> or like an act is, is written. Um, you can kind of identify the wind you want. So 
Um, okay, these are my, if you go to the next one, these are my like things I want you to remember. <laughs> um, you will not win with charity. <laughs> so whatever it is that you want, whatever problem it is that we are working towards eradicating or eliminating and justice that we're seeking, charity is not gonna get you there. It's gonna be solidarity and action. Um, it's important to set up systems within your organization that help to come to a consensus around advocacy goals and to make sure that that's not just like a group of white salaried managers coming to a consensus about what's important. Whose voices are you actually prioritizing within that process? Um, and do they have lived experience with the issue that you are working on? Um, think of how you're organizing and how you're mobilizing. If you're only doing one of them, you're not gonna get very far very fast. You wanna have both of them. And at the same time, you wanna have a political analysis about how it all fits together and where you're going. Um, get your own house in order. <laughs> this is something that FoodShare really, you know, like we've heard from a lot of folks who say, you know, they want to be advocating for better wages, but they don't pay a living wage. And so therefore they don't advocate for better wages. Well, you, what you can do is pay a living wage and advocate for better wages. <laughs> um, so I think if you're making advocacy statements or public statements, but they're not aligned with the work that you organization is doing yourself, um, that's an important thing to consider. Um, if you're in leadership at your organization. And then the last slide had a couple. Um, if you're doing something good that your staff are proud of, do it louder. Because a lot of organizations have told FoodShare that um, if FoodShare does, takes a step, they, make, they maybe can't take the same step as far, but they can take a similar step. So I think that people need to be a bit, a bit louder about the good work that they're doing. Um, consider your theory of change. I've seen a lot of organizations when creating a theory of change, uh, they use that process as explaining why they do what they currently do. Um, and I would like to challenge more organizations to start from what do you want to win and how will you win it? And be prepared to stop doing some things and start doing other things to be able to get to that goal quicker. Um, work in coalition um, and throw your support behind grassroots community groups that are already doing the work. I've seen this a lot too when organizations says we want to start working on poverty and they don't pay attention to the grassroots groups that have been doing this for decades um, and have been actually winning and, and, and getting those wins. So find those groups and endorse them, resource them, <laughs> amplify their work and pay them. Um, and then think critically about the space that you take up as an organization, especially if you're a large organization, a national organization, a well-resourced organization. Um, there's times for organizations like that to be loud um, and critical because it's less risky for them and that's useful for them to be doing that work. Um, and there's times when what they need to do is quietly stand behind or beside um, another group that's leading the work. So to, to be critical about yourself and open to critique from community to think about what's the most appropriate use of your resources and your space and your voice. So. These are hard lessons we've learned at FoodShare, so I'm happy to um, share them with you. So I think that's everything. Awesome, thank you, Katie. Um, also impressed by your ability to run down um, complex uh, work that FoodShare has been doing into it. <laughs> Anyways, I appreciate both, both of you have done a really great job kind of bringing us through how to consider advocacy work and the pragmatic approaches that um, organizations and individuals can be considering in, 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 your, in your doing with a great political analysis that you both shared. Um, so thank you for that.